are going live and we're live. Uh, welcome everyone to this very special panel by PhD Balance, Pregnancy in Grad School. Thank you so much for joining us and a big thank you to our panelists who are um, going to share their experiences with us today. I'm Linda, I'm going to be the facilitator today and I am Grad Chat Lead and a Twitter Coordinator for PhD Balance. And um, I will let our panelists introduce themselves, um, but I'm very glad to be joined by Javi, Alexa, and Eben. And we will be joined in a few minutes by Pamela, who is at a conference currently, but will be sharing her experiences too. So um, welcome everyone. And um, I will let our panelists introduce themselves. So we're gonna start with, tell us a little about yourself, your family, if you'd like to include it, and what stage of grad school you were when you got pregnant. So uh, why don't we start with um, Eben? Yeah. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Eben Rickett Sullivan. I um, live in Louisiana, but I recently finished my PhD from Dartmouth College in Quantitative Biomedical Sciences. I also have a master's degree in epidemiology from Tulane. I'm originally from Louisiana. I have a almost 16 month son, um, and my husband is a law professor here in Louisiana. That's me. Awesome. Um, Javi, would you like to go next? Yeah. So hi, everyone. My name is Javier Rudolph. I'm originally from Latin America, from Chile and then Ecuador. Um, I, let's see, I got, <clears throat> I just got my PhD. I'm actually, my graduation ceremony is tomorrow. Yay. Super excited. Um, and I have two kids. The first one I had when I was in my second year, I think, of graduate school. And he is four and a half. And my second, uh, she's 10 months old right now. And so um, a little bit about our family is that I actually met my husband during my PhD program and we got married during our PhDs as well. And so um, that that has implications too by being at the same career stage in a way and yeah I don't we'll see with further questions later on but um that's what I have right now I guess <laughs> awesome um Alexa would you like to go next Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Alexa Quinn. Um, I am at the University of Virginia. I finished my PhD here in 2021, and I'm now in a postdoctoral position. And then this fall, I'm starting as an assistant professor at James Madison University, which is about an hour away from here. So I'm excited about that. Um, I have two kids and I, I brought a picture um, that I'll share quickly. Of course, uh, I, my partner is supportive in many ways, which is very important uh, in having a baby in grad school. But this is like, I think the only photograph I have of me and my two children. So it's a selfie in bed. Um, so I have Owen, he's uh, almost three and he was born at the end of my second year in the PhD program. And then Leah is uh, 10 weeks old and she was born um, sort of midway through my postdoc. And so I, I saw a question that was like comparing the two time periods in which uh, you might have kids. And so I'm happy to weigh in on my experience at least. Um, what was the other question? I think that was, those were the main ones for the introduction. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. And then uh, Pamela, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Sorry, I just finished um, presenting at a conference. So the, jump right in <laughs> from one to another because that's what we do. Um, my name is Pamela Fullerton. I'm so excited to be here today to talk about motherhood and school and everything that we can do and we can do it all. So um, I am currently in my PhD. Um, I am taking my comprehensive final exams on Friday. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Uh, I have two beautiful girls. Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> The answer. <laughs> I think awesome. that, it's a lot of balance. Go ahead, <laughs> Linda. <laughs> no, um, thank you all so so much for being here. Um, this is absolutely great, and I think there's a lot, so much knowledge, and so much um, 
power in this panel. Um, and uh, I think we're going to try and get to as many questions as possible. Um, oh, um, someone asked, could you all say what field your PhD is in for context? Uh, mine is in counselor education and supervision. I'm in curriculum and instruction with a focus on elementary teacher preparation. I knew there was something I missed in my intro. <laughs> I'm a biologist ecologist. Quantitative biomedical sciences. Awesome. Thank you all so much. Um, so I guess one of the to dive right right in um, and start with, um, I guess maybe this isn't a question you all would like to answer, but if you would like to answer it. Were any of your pregnancies planned? Because we did get a couple of questions about planning versus unplanning. <laughs> and you don't have to answer this if you don't want to. <laughs> I'll answer that. Uh, no, they weren't. And I am a planner. Everything else in my life is planned. <laughs> um, I am where I am because of my planning. But my two pregnancies were not. Um, and so I have, I have this image of me um, with one of my children, I had her while I was doing my internship for counseling. So 700 plus hours of counseling internship, working a full-time job. I had a newborn baby and um, I put, you know, during my graduation, I had her under my robe breastfeeding her. And then it was about to be my time to go up on stage. I handed her to my cousin. I walked on stage and I was like, Okay, here we go. <laughs> so that is, you know, that's how unplanned it was. Mine was planned, but I would say in retrospect, people will talk a lot about like timing it in your program. And I just want to like name that that's something that it's really hard to do. And some people are, are privileged and lucky enough that it works out the way that they're sort of hoping and timing out. But for many women, that's not the case. And um, and to just like name that and recognize that, that people might try to say like, oh, well, shouldn't you try to do it over the summer? Or shouldn't you try to do it in this year or that year? And like, if you wanna become a parent, you should work toward that goal and, and not stress about when exactly it's gonna happen because not everyone has the ability to pinpoint it as they might so choose. Yeah, going off on that, so we planned our pregnancies as well, but we did not plan for the miscarriages we had in between. And so that is something that, you know, even if you do plan it, there's always something that you just can't account for. Um, it's something I really want to bring up right away from like the beginning is that we always assume that if you get pregnant, it's just like, oh, you're pregnant. And like the hard part comes with the baby. My first pregnancy was relatively okay, but I want to say that my second one was very debilitating and I was sick most of the time. And that is something that I did not count on. So not to like tell you not to get pregnant, obviously not, but it's something you never even thought of. Cause you know, I always had this image of like, Ooh, pregnant women, happy women with their belly is just like hustling and doing it all, you know? I just did not expect to find myself throwing up until 37 weeks of my second pregnancy, which completely derailed about a lot of things. Um, so uh, mine, I'm gonna say both yes and no. Um, I, I'm sure anyone in the position of sort of thinking about having a family will sort of, will learn to experience maybe might have experienced this themselves or like experiencing it. But, you know, I got pregnant at 33, but my husband is almost 10 years older than me. And so I sort of had this kind of weight on my shoulders of like, we need to be mindful of, of when we're going to start having a family. And with that in mind too, knowing that both of us had a medical history that would, we were told would take us a while to get pregnant. And so there was like the idea of like, okay, we're going to like IUDs removed. It's all, you know, like, let's see how this goes. Like, we'll like try and see what happens. And then like by a miracle, it happened immediately. Um, and so that was, that was my, my experience. So. Awesome. Um, I thank you so much for answering and um, for being so open. Um, 
I think that um, one question that we got a lot of is, how do you tell your advisor and when do you tell your advisor? <laughs> Difficult question. <laughs> I can go on that one because I, um, I think, so my, my advisor is amazing and he was always very supportive from the beginning. And considering that I got married during the program, I think we already had like this understanding, I guess he was very supportive of just having a life, you know, just keep going with life as you're doing your PhD. And it's something that he also um, sort of, um, does himself, you know, his family comes first. And we had a conversation about like, Hey, I'm thinking about like having kids. What's your perspective on this? And he was like, have them during grad school. It's awesome. Like I had my kids during grad school. You do it right away. You get it out of the way. It's like, great. The flexibility. It's awesome. And so I didn't have, like, I guess I, of course, told him when I was pregnant, but I already had that, like, background of him being fully supportive, which I am extremely lucky for having had that. What I will say, though, is that he is a man. He did not experience pregnancy during grad school, and he had a stay-at-home wife that during graduate school took care of the kids. <laughs> so super supportive. Um but also different perspective. And, and of course, when I shared that I was pregnant, it was just nothing other than joy. And he organized the meal train for us. And so in my particular case, it was very supportive from the beginning. Yeah, I similarly was very lucky. My advisor is a woman and mother. And um, so I, I felt really safe being able to know that like she would be supportive and, and sort of know what I was going through and, and, and help me think about how to navigate it. I did feel pretty, I don't know, protective of myself, of my family and privacy. And, and even though we had a really strong relationship, waited until after sort of 12 week checks and, and things like that uh, with my first um, and, and debated about, do I do it in an email and, and ended up doing it in person. And it maybe like a little bit before I would otherwise have because we were starting to look ahead at the next semester and, and teaching assignments and all kinds of things like that. So um, I ended up doing it in sort of a regularly scheduled check in when we were looking ahead to the next, you know, next few semesters and, uh, and that worked out well for me. Um, I also, I have a really fantastic advisor who's uh, a man who was has three children and is very active um, parent. And so I felt uh, I was not at all worried about having a conversation with him. And I told him at 16 weeks, I am extraordinarily superstitious. And so I just wanted to wait until it was something that was just, I felt a little bit more control and peace over. Um, the thing that I will sort of add to that um, I was petrified to tell my committee I, I mean, I'm like getting, I'm like feeling all the feels right now, thinking back to that time. Um, you know, I had just like defended my quals successfully and felt like I was finally in like a really good position. And then I got pregnant and I told my advisor and he was so supportive and so wonderful. And then I like had four more people I had to bring on board. And then I, I was, I just sh like shook in my boots. I did it via zoom. Cause this was in the, the, height of the pandemic and thankfully everything went well. And the thing that I, like, I really do hope um, is true for, for all of you is, you know, that people just, and my, my community was just so incredibly supportive. I think that the fact that I, you know, did it via Zoom and maybe not via email and like incorporated them and kind of like asked that, you know, their feedback and what they felt comfortable with and told them like what I felt comfortable with. And we had these sort of candid conversations. I think that helped. Um, it, I feel like that was something that made the experience a little bit um, more comfortable for me. I'm in my therapist brain right now. So my first thing was what's, what is the biggest worry about telling the advisor? 
right? And so that's what I, I'm going to actually, instead of talking about me, put that back on anybody who's wondering about that question. It's like, what are you exactly worried about? Are you worried about your advisor? Are you worried about timing? Are you worried about, you know, what exactly are you worried about? And kind of sort that out first, because maybe it has nothing to do with your advisor, right? Everybody here talked about how supportive their advisor is. If your advisor isn't supportive, you know, as a doctoral student, you can change advisors, right? You have that right to do that. And in fact, I had to do that. So um, uh, you know, I would say kind of figure out for yourself where that worry is coming from and then discuss that with like somebody that you are really close to maybe in the program, somebody who can quell some of those fears or validate some of those fears and then figure out, you know, how, how you want to go about doing it, what would make you comfortable, um, at what stage do you feel like um, someone has to earn that information, that's your private information, you know, I love how um, Alexa said, like, she was private with her family, like, she's protective of her family, right, like, that's your information to share, you do it, you know, you do with it what you need to do with it. very important. Um, thank you all for sharing. It's just, um, sorry, I just love that you're all being so open and that this is a conversation that we're having because a lot of people, I think a lot of people on social media were so happy that we were having this conversation, but some people were surprised as well. So it's a conversation that needs to be had more. Um, I guess moving along, it's. Um, I know, Javi, you've mentioned that your second pregnancy was stressful and did not go the way that you expected. But for all of you, how did your pregnancies go? How did finding time off, I guess this goes with advisors as well, for scans, for doctor's appointments, for whatever you needed and any accommodations you needed, go? What did you need? Sorry, that's a load of questions at once. <laughs> um, let's start with how did it go? <laughs> I can jump in. Um, so my son, who I was pregnant with during coursework um, and sort of this, I was pregnant in the second year of my program. Um, so I was pretty lucky for, for my first pregnancy uh, to have like uh, not a ton of morning sickness. I would wake up really nauseous and my uh, my partner, my husband, who also is at the university, uh, we would like go in together, like first thing in the morning and park together. And then, so like getting up was built into our commute and how it worked with our vehicles and our parking. And I remember that being really rough. And it, I had to learn, like, you have to eat, even if you don't want to eat. Uh, otherwise it just gets worse for me anyway. Um, but the bit, the biggest, most big the memories I have from that year and being in classes is my Ziploc bag of fruit. Like that was the thing I could eat <laughs> and like keeping my blood sugar up was really important. And I would just like go through grapes and strawberries like constantly during class, which wouldn't have worked during COVID. This was 2019. Um, so I think about that too, that I was just like constantly eating during courses, um, maybe to the detriment of people around me, like I <laughs> just like shoveling fruit in my mouth. Um, but that, that was how that went, um, for appointments and things like that, I think, and it totally varies, I think based on program, as to how much lab work you're doing and teacher education, um, a lot, you know, a lot of the work is, is like in classrooms and there's some sort of scheduling that you have to work around there. But for my coursework years, I, I had a lot of flexibility. I think there's some privilege to being pregnant in grad school where you're not in a job where you have really set hours. And I, I thought about that a lot when I would sort of look at my schedule and make an appointment for a time that fit within my academic schedule and know that there are women and, and mothers that are, that are having to take time off to, to do an appointment and put in for specific leave to do so. And so I, I felt for me in my circumstances, I felt really privileged to be able to have the flexibility to make appointments around my schedule. Um, so I was pregnant in like the, I got pregnant right when the pandemic started and basically had an entire like 
COVID pregnancy, COVID baby. So we were completely remote, which had its benefits and its drawbacks. The benefits, of course, being I took a lot of meetings from my bed and no one knew the difference. I had um, one course and two journal clubs during my pregnancy that no one, no one knew I was pregnant, um, which, you know, again, drawback has its drawbacks and um, has its advantages. Um, and since we were remote, I had the luxury of scheduling my um, appointments whenever it worked for me and, and my husband. So I'm a little bit of an aberration and I don't know um, to what extent uh, the remote versus hybrid options will, will be for students in the future. But um, I don't know how much of my experience is, is that um, applicable right now. Um, the thing I'll say about my health and my or my health during my pregnancy, I had very textbook um, first and second trimester, and then all hell broke loose in the third trimester, as um, sometimes <laughs> happens. And um, I, you know, ended up on bed rest at about thirty six weeks, and I went um, into labor almost three weeks early. So um, I definitely can speak to being hospitalized during pregnancy, having going into labor early, being scared, um, having a pretty traumatic birth experience and trying to navigate all of that um, while trying to get my dissertation prepared. So um, that's. I can go. <laughs> um. So I was lucky to experience two very different pregnancies at very different times. So I was pregnant with my first in 2018, 2017. And by then I was in my second year. I had not taken my quals yet. I had done my proposal defense, but I had not done the qualifying exams yet. So I still had some coursework. I was still teaching like a TA a course. And to be honest, that pregnancy, I was kind of nauseous, but it really went smoothly. That was like, I just had a growing belly, but overall, everything else was the same. I remembered like towards the latter weeks, I think like two days before I actually went into labor, I was at school at meetings. It was like, oh my gosh, can I just like give birth to this baby? I'll keep busy, I guess, because like nothing else is going on. But so that one was my first experience. I didn't have um, maternity leave with either of kids, but I taught remote, like I taught online courses for both of them. So that was some balance that I had to juggle. With my second pregnancy and my second kid, it was during COVID. Everything and everyone was like kind of out of it, I guess. So I guess for us, it was like, well, everyone's just like, doesn't know what to do. So might as well just try for a baby right now. And like, we'll see how it goes. And same as even I had most of my pregnancy here at home, which was a huge blessing because that was a really rough pregnancy. I was vomiting all the time. I, um, it was, yeah, that one was rough. And I have to say that having everything be remote was really amazing. It's like, it didn't matter. I could turn my camera off and feel like crap and lay in bed and still be on meetings. And in a way, it was also a distraction for me. It was like, oh, thank goodness I have work to keep me going right now because I feel like absolute crap. So that, yeah. Well, uh, you know, very, I think we're all in the like, different fields, right? But there's definitely more a science-y feel I, <laughs> with, my, with my partners over here. Um, but as a, you know, somebody in the mental health field, um, you know, work doesn't stop, right? Um, I made a commitment to the clients that I'm serving, to the people that I'm serving. And I, I teach at the university level adjunct as well. And I tell the future clinicians, like, at times we need to compartmentalize, right? Like I could have just vomited in a bucket and then I'm like, I got my meeting in five minutes with my client, let's go bring your A game because your client needs you, you know? Um, and at other times, because um, part of our code of ethics is self-care, we have to know when we need to stop. We have to know when 
uh, I, I can't focus on my client. And therefore, if I'm in a meeting with them and I can't focus on them, I'm hurting them. I'm harming them. I'm doing them a disservice, right? And so it's kind of juggling those two worlds of when you can compartmentalize and say, I'm going to throw up and get back to this meeting. I'm going to throw, you're right. I'm going to, I'm in pain, but I'm going to, I'm going to focus and do what I need to do. use some distress tolerance, mindfulness skills, whatever you need to do. And then there are other times where you say, no, right now I need to focus on myself, my family, my health, whatever it may be. And you alter plans. And that's part of life, you know? Um, you know, one of my favorite books is Of Mice and Men by John Steinbeck, right? And the title of that book comes from a Scottish poem uh, by Robert Burns. It says, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry, right? And so we can plan, but, and planning is good. And you should have a plan A and a plan B and a plan C, but just know they might not work out. And that's okay. And you got to like learn to roll with it a little bit. And if you have to extend your dissertation, you extend your dissertation. If you, you do what you need to do, um, you know, and prioritize as you see fit in the moment. It's very important. And um, I guess the next topic, which Javi already touched on is maternity leave. So did you get any? Was it a, I know country to country, it varies. So in department to department, it varies. Did your department have a policy or was it sort of flailing in the dark sort of situation? Um, so to come put this in context, I'm in a biology department. Uh, we get finance through TA ships, so we work based on semesters, and our tuition gets waived based on that teaching. And so if you were to take the six weeks of leave that you're supposedly kind of allowed to take, I guess, um, it's like you're dropping out of that semester, and so then you have to pay back that tuition. So it's like this very, like, weird thing and in addition to that I was also an international student with my first child which meant that I was also in limbo of like what does this mean for immigration because if I take time off I'm not a student anymore do I get kicked out of everywhere <laughs> or not so I just went with like no time off and no maternity leave and the way we worked that out was I just TA'd the classes I had to TA. I, um, I TA'd and um, I requested for online TAs, which I was very lucky to get because there's not a lot of them. But I kind of feel like there was just a lot of behind the scenes work that was obviously not institution wide, like the university couldn't care less about this, but the people did. My advisor did. The person that I TA'd for did. The graduate coordinator, they all cared. And so they, I think the behind the scenes work was very crucial for me. And I, I had a whole semester for both kids that was just like online teaching where I would monitor discussions and grade a lot. But this did mean that I could, I mean, it was pros and cons, right? I could just, the flexibility is a, a pro and a con is, I could grade and do all these things pretty much any time. And it also me meant that if I was very anxious at two in the morning, because I felt like my work was falling behind, I was grading at two in the morning when the baby had just woken up. And so I think it's just kind of, for me personally, the theme of having kids in grad school was like this flexibility in my department, in my program was essential. So within my, the graduate school um, at large at Dartmouth College offers 12 weeks of paid maternity leave in accordance with the belief. Well, I mean, I, I know I think FMLA is like unpaid, but they try and uh, anyway, so it's 12 weeks is what I was given in uh, along with the flexibility of using that 12 weeks of however I wanted to. And so I took eight full weeks and then I did um eight part like eight um, halftime uh, weeks and with the idea that that would help transition me back into full-time 
Um, I, if I could recommend, if I could redo one thing, it would be to find a way to get more time. I was just so broken and I, I just mentally, physically, everything I'd if there were any way I could have taken vacation or talked to my advisor and said, I need more time. I wish that's like my one, my one regret from that. So if I can offer any advice to, to pregnant women, or if you're thinking about having a family really take as much time as you can, because it, you need it, the baby needs it. And um, yeah. yeah, I can build on that. I think, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Pam. Pamela, sorry, I don't know why I shortened your name there for you. Um, I I think I think that that's really good advice, and also just knowing that there's there's things you won't know until after you've had your baby and what your delivery experience is like, what your birth experience is like, um, what kind of recovery you need. I needed for my son to do um, pretty intensive pelvic floor PT um, just based on the delivery that I had. And, and that took time and it was just like very painful to be, (laughs) to be a person for a while. Um, but I hadn't, you know, you can't anticipate that. And for my daughter, uh, you know, who's 10 weeks old, I felt ready to be doing something sooner. Like maybe I overcorrected and I was sort of like, I carved out time and, and actually maybe what, what would have worked better is to do, be doing a little bit at like half speed for longer rather than having like a solid protected amount of time. So I think to the extent you can giving yourself space to say like, here's what I think, you know, is a bare minimum, but also I want to check in, you know, after I deliver and a month after I deliver and, and, and see how things are going and, and be flexible. And again, in academia, that's what I think is one of the things that we have going for us, but there is a little bit more flexibility. Um, I was teaching full time prior to the birth of my son and then went to sort of a more of a TA role the first fall and then and then was able to decide for the spring, did I want to be a full instructor uh, or did I want to have another TA position? And I was glad I had left that choice up to make later. Alexa, I was just going to make a joke that maybe we should all move to Canada and get like much better maternity leave. Like in America, our maternity leave is terrible. Hear me, America. It's terrible. Okay. (laughs) All right. So now that I got that gripe off, um, you know, I just, I have like these memories rushing back to me right now. Like I remember breast uh, uh, pumping in the bathroom at a residential facility I was working at. You know, I remember, it's like, all these things that I shouldn't have to do because I I should have been able to be home when I, when I needed to be home. Right. And I, uh, you know, luckily have, uh, you know, my spouse who had good insurance and enough for me to be like, if I wanted to call it quits, I'm gonna call it quits. Right. There are like definitely privilege at work on, on some of those things. And so I want to speak to, uh, you know, the population that, maybe can't, doesn't have access to all of that and say, you know, um, really what you need to be, if you, if you're thinking about motherhood, right, you're thinking about having a child, you know, look at your resources, who's going to be there to support you? Like when you have to go to class and you have to go in person and you can't take that baby, you know, who's going to be there to, to, to manage that baby so that you don't have to worry, you know, that you're there in good hands, you know, um, if you have to go back to work early, who's going to, you know, who's going to provide that child care? Um, you know, the cost of child care is ridiculous. Um, I remind my children all the time how much I've spent on them in child care, right? And, and so that has to be taken into consideration. You know, at the university, do they offer low cost, no cost child care? That might be a consideration to choose a university that may offer that. That might be a really good incentive for you. You know, all those things need to be taken into consideration. I like how even said her university gave like 12 weeks pay. That's more than most places give women. You know, I just want to say that. So um, all of that, I think, needs to be con- taken into consideration if it can be, right? If you're, if you're thinking about it um, so that you can, you know, provide yourself with like 
a, a space to just sort all, all of that out because I know some of us um, have like a superwoman complex and we're like, yeah, I'm gonna have this baby. It's gonna be fine. I'll be back at work in six weeks. I'll see y'all in six weeks. It'll be no problem. And then you get that baby and it's like, I don't wanna leave him. Right, I mean, hormones are all over the place. Life is all over the place. You don't, you don't know what's going to happen. So just like allow yourself space for all of that have your, like I said, plan A, plan B, your contingency plans, have your supports, know what kind of supports are going to be there for you, no matter what, that you can count on those, because that's helpful too. Um, And then at the end of the day, you're going to have to decide, you know, um, like what's best, what's best for you in that moment and how you're going to proceed with that. I just want to add one thing, which is, I think that that experience of like thinking you're going to be able to do it all. And then like giving birth and being like, like, I don't, I don't want to do anything. I want to be here with my baby. Like that, that doesn't happen for everybody. And I, I think that I was very lucky that the person I most needed to be protected from was myself, right. That like, I, I did not, I was lucky not to have to fight for time from all of the people around me, but like, I kind of needed someone to tell me to not, I don't, or, or, or not. I don't know. I like, I, did not have this moment of magical, like now I'm a mother. And like, I just want to be with my baby. Like my brain was still thinking about my research and, and I think that's okay. Right. I want to normalize that. That doesn't mean like, you're not a good mother. (laughs) Um, at least I don't think so. Um, and also it, it's, it's tricky. And I think you need the support of your partner and family to think about what it means to, to have, time to like have your academic identity too, as you have a newborn and you're like, what is this about? Um, but then also to have people who you trust to tell you like, no, like this will still be here in a little while. And, and no, I'm not going to like include you in these meetings. You don't need to be part of like, I don't know, but also giving you choice. It's a mess. I still don't know what's exactly the right thing to do, but know that like a whole range of feelings is normal. Very important. Um, I guess one question that we did get in the chat is did when you were pregnant, just before we go on to other topics, um, did the way that you work change? I know some of you were in the pandemic, so that may have been changes anyway, but how did the way that you work change? Did you need certain accommodations? I know, uh, Javi, you said that you were an ecologist. There wasn't field work going on in the pandemic. <laughs> so I guess I should have clarified that too. So I started my 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 program with a very clear like field ecology uh, project. And then things didn't work out that way. And I turned into more of a quantitative ecology project and I think that aligned with my goals like I think that actually was kind of like oh we didn't get the funding to do field work so we're gonna pivot to a quantitative thing oh I just can't work with computers now is the time to have a baby I guess that's how it was for us and like in our head is like I don't have to go to the Amazon for three months in a row I guess we should just have a baby now, <laughs> you know, that's kind of how we thought of it. Um, and, and I think it worked out. So like now I finished my PhD as a quantitative ecologist. That's what I've done. And I, I, getting back to what Alexa was saying, I guess it was really interesting because with my first, I was very protective. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't send this little thing anywhere. Also we're completely broke, so we can't. <laughs> so I'm just going to, do it all with the baby here for the first year. Whereas with my second baby, I was like, okay, I'm done. I'm like, ready, six weeks. This baby's got to go to daycare. I got to get my research going again. I was writing grants to start field work and like, you know, kind of get back to those initial things. And because of the pandemic, there was just no day, no childcare anywhere. So she's almost a year old and she's still not in childcare. So <laughs> it's been uh, a trip. Yeah. It's just a lot of adapting. You just kind of keep going with whatever is thrown at you. And I think having a spouse, a partner that's really in it, like for all of the craziness is really important. Um, 
so no, I did not need accommodations for field work. I think we planned around it, it was like, oh, quantitative, yes, family time now. But I do know a lot of other women that have done field work pregnant, and that's amazing. I couldn't get out of the bed while pregnant. So it's just such a big range of things that can happen. And I think maybe that's what you need to plan. Have the right people to support whatever is thrown at you. Very fair. Um, I guess um, the next question is, we got, you've touched on it. How are you managing childcare in your position navigating the pandemic to people with two children, especially? Um, so uh, Javi's um, touched on it. Anyone else like to touch on it? <laughs> uh, my mom finally retired and I'm like, bye. <laughs> that was I finally get I finally get what I've heard other people have which is like the family members help out with the child care I've never experienced that and now I have and it's like mom please don't ever go anywhere <laughs> I need you in my life um so that that is like I said you gotta leverage your resources right who's willing who's willing to support you and um you know, since, and I, I encouraged my mom to retire and I was like, I'll pay for your insurance. Right. So I'll pay for, I'll do whatever you need me to do. So, uh, I feel like it's a good reciprocity going on between us and she gets to finally take care of one of, you know, two of her grandchildren. So, um, leverage your resources but if not, I'm telling you like look into university daycare systems, things like that you know, sliding scale, if you need that sliding scale daycare systems. I know the pandemic made that a lot harder and worse. Um, but, you know, I encourage everybody to advocate for what they need, right? Um, I tell my clients, closed mouths don't get fed. So you got to open your mouth, advocate for what you need, reach out to people. Maybe somebody else has a, has a, a, a resource that they can leverage for you. Um, yeah. Awesome. Go ahead. Uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just, um, I really, Pamela was just, I really, I'm very much enjoying your perspective. Um, I, ha I only have one child, so I know that I, that the question was sort of directed at um, two, but the one thing that I, I will sort of share is that um, my son is almost 16 months old and he's on two wait lists and is still not in daycare. Like that's a reality that, um, I think a lot of women face. And um, thankfully my the my mom sold her house about a day ago, Pamela, and she is on her way down. And I, you know, not everybody has that luxury, but we got to, you know, wait the year that she needed to be able to be eligible to retire. And um, you know, the circumstances are changing. But I, I will say that if you're faced with those circumstances where you don't have childcare available to you through your university and the that there are very few facilities, especially if you are in a rural um, program or rural area, um, it is really challenging. And I think that the um, the resource for me was extending my stay in my program. I graduated six months later than um, I wanted to, than I had planned to, than my advisor had planned for me. Um, and that was just where the release valve was. And so that was you know, your resources might not always be sort of finite physical capital. Sometimes it's looking at your timeline and like what you can accomplish and what you can't accomplish and being really like honest and kind to yourself and to, to your family. So that's just what I wanted to add. Yeah, I'm glad you said that. I think super important to name that some of these timelines that get set up and that, again, you feel like you, you need to stick to like they're, they're arbitrary, right. <laughs> and they're flexible. And, um, I, I have similar sort of, uh, a sliding scale daycare that, that we, um, I, you know, we're privileged my, that my husband's, he's a faculty member. So we had double income and we were able to, um, and we were able to afford daycare, but I think we, we intentionally picked one that, that does have a sliding scale to, to be more accessible to a wider range of families. Um, and 
there are definitely scholarship programs for daycare that that exist, um, but the wait lists are real. We were also lucky to have family support. Um, first grandchild on both sides really gets a lot of extra, a lot of extra help. Um, but also the things that you figure out along the way as a new mom of like baby wearing, like get your hands, get your hands free. If the first wrap you try on doesn't work, like most local areas will have a place where um, or a community where you can try on multiple that until you find the thing that works to get your hands free for you. Um, so little things like that, I think are also important. I will add one more tidbit since people were really curious about childcare. If you're at a university, look at the early childhood education programs. You might be able to find a graduate level student or somebody like that who can also, you know, depending on how comfortable you feel, but they, they need hours, right? They need, they, they need practice. So, um, you know, again, this is leverage your resources, see what, what is out there for you. Um, one of another question that we had, um, I guess a big one, um, how do you navigate the tough balance of being a present mom and completing a rigorous program like a PhD? No sleep. <laughs> it's not it's not a joke. Like I I think it's to the detriment of my own health and my lack of sleep. I am severely anemic and I didn't find that out until like I finally got pushed to like go to the physician and get blood work done because you just keep going. I mean you just keep going. It's not great, it's not healthy, obviously. But yeah, my kid comes first and most of the time, but I do have a spouse that's very involved, obviously. So I, you just rely on them, I guess. So you, when you're with your kids, you're with your kids. When you do have childcare, you just focus on work and you make whatever thing work so that you can work. So one of the things I have a really hard time with is writing. I'm sure everyone does. But I discovered that if I'm really anxious and I need to write, I can use dictation in my phone on Word and just like fast paced walking, talking, writing. And that works. And you just, that's one of the things that you kind of figure out. But yeah, not sleeping is a big one, I'd say. On that, I feel like it helped me. I was a, I was a, like a procrastinating writer, right? Like I sort of have high expectations for making every sentence I write perfect. And you don't have time to do that when you have a kid. So it sort of forced me to like, get, get things out. You have this much time to write and not having like the hours stretching ahead actually maybe helped me, um, get out drafts more efficiently. Um, so I wouldn't count on it, but I definitely feel like it sort of forced me to write because you have only so much time to do so. Sorry, Pamela, go ahead. Javiera cracked me up, right? Because she's like, no sleep. And she's smiling. <laughs> it's like, we smile through our pain sometimes. And I think that that's what a dissertation, that's what a PhD program is sometimes. We, we smile through that pain. But, um, you know, I, I recently published a book and I talk about how um, there's like three spaces we can be in comfortable on the edge of chaos and in chaos. If you ever find yourself in chaos, like really psychological distress is like at its highest. That's not where you want to be. You can't grow. You can't be the person you want to be. You're not going to be able to write your papers no matter what you try to do, right? Because everything else is kind of going to be around you in chaos. You don't want to be comfortable either, right? You don't want to be sitting back doing the same old things because that's that's not going to help you grow, right? But edge on, edge and the edge of chaos. That means that you're juggling multiple things. That means that maybe on Tuesday and Wednesday night you don't sleep, but then you make sure you catch that up on Thursday, right? That's what that's what it means. Is like we can't run on fumes. We can't keep going on nothing, right? So we have to find ways to fill ourselves back up. We can last a couple of days, some of us. I, I know there are some of my colleagues who are like, I can't pull an all-nighter. I just can't, right? And I was like, I can. 
Um, so, you know, I can pull an all nighter for like a day or two, and then I need to make sure I recover. And so that's, that's what I think the finding the balance is, is like looking ahead and saying, okay, these next, this next two weeks are going to be rough. I'm going to push myself through these two weeks, but then I'm going to make sure that on that third week, I'm going to give myself the rest and recovery that I need so that I can be there for everybody I need to be there for. The bottom line is, as women, as mothers, there's so much more expected of us. That's the, that's the honest truth. Um, no matter how supportive our partners are, I guarantee you, if we each answered honestly, we probably still have more than a 50% stake in our lives and everything that we do. So uh, we have to give ourselves the space to like sit back and say, no, I deserve a rest right now. I deserve some respite right now. Um, and make sure that we are, you know, on that edge of chaos and not going on the other two directions. I did everything wrong. So I will preface that. I did everything wrong. I was not present for a lot of the early parts. I wasn't, I mean, I just, I was in my own head. I was re like thinking about research, thinking about what I needed to do next, why I was behind, how could I do this? Like, how do I edit this paper while feeding him, you know, doing a nighttime feeding? Like, can I read him my like draft manuscript as a nighttime, like a bedtime story? Like, is that okay? Because you know, like that's what I was, that was sort of the mindset I was thinking. And I remember buying this book about power moms that had just come out. And I was like, yes, this, I'm going to read this like during my feedings and it's going to give me inspiration. It's going to make me like be able to do everything all at once. And like, the answer is no, like I, and I learned the hard way. It took six months until I really, I, maybe even longer until I think I was a much more present mother. And I look back on, on that time as sort of a, of a whirlwind. And I, I didn't know how to pull myself out of it. Like my husband didn't know how to help get me out of it. And like the honest truth is that I needed help. And I thankfully like was able to find uh, like a, a counselor who specialized and she is a godsend. And I'm so grateful because that was how I found a way to make time for myself. And I, it's horrible that it took as long as it did, but I'm grateful that it happened, that I was able to do it, that my husband helped push me to do it and gave me the support for it. And um, I'm a better mother because of it. Awesome. Um, shout out to therapy and counseling. It's great for so many people. <laughs> Shout out to therapy and counseling. Yes, yes, we, we, we go through a lot. Why not put our mental health first? If, if even if you broke your arm, you would have been at the doctor right away, right? And so, yes, and there are people who specialize in that and there are, you know, bringing, bring your birth itself is traumatic. It's traumatic right? You need, to, you need to talk to somebody about that. Somebody who can understand like what you just went through. Uh, yes. I, I cannot emphatically state enough how important it is that we take care of our mental health um, before having a kid, while having a kid, after having a kid, all of that. Like always, we have to take care of our mental health. Absolutely. And I guess... The final question that we're going to end with is, um, is there anything, and I know you've spoken about this um, a couple of times, but is there anything that has happened in your parenting or in your pregnancy that you just did not see coming that you would like to warn other people about? <laughs> I had an unexpected C-section. It was awful. It was really awful. I didn't, um, I was, my water broke by itself and I was feeling good and going to the hospital and I was in labor for three days. My child wouldn't come out. And then on the third day after not sleeping or eating or doing anything for over three days, they were like, we have to do a C-section. That was, um, that was super scary. I wish I wish something would have gone differently or that I would have known more. I would have, 
I don't know if anything could have really prepared me for what was about to happen to me, but it was scary. And I just want to put that out there. Like if, if that should happen to you, you know, um, make sure that you take care of yourself afterward and, you know, you, you treat yourself the way you need to be treated. Cause that's a whole additional layer of something that happens during pregnancy that you may have not expected. Well, my heart goes out to you. I, I, I also had it. I had a C-section as well. Um, it was planned and unplanned. Um, but I think the thing that I, I encourage every woman to remember is that, you know, your physician or your practitioners of be it a midwife or a mid-level provider or a doctor, they are experts on the human body. They're not experts on your body and every body is different. And rem- just hold that in, in your mind and in your heart, because you know, what's best for yourself and your family. And I know it's scary. I know I was just petrified, but you are the best advocate for yourself. You and your partner are, you know, you guys are the best advocates for yourself and never be afraid to say, I'm scared. This is not what I want. Like, I, like I need a minute. Like, I just think that you're the, the best advocate for yourself. Yeah, I'll echo and continue that thread. Um, I thought, I guess this was unexpected too. I was like, I'm gonna, this is my, it's gonna go long. It's gonna be like, I was two weeks late myself. My, my, my mom had to have a C-section to get me out of there. I was like, that's gonna happen to me. I sort of planned accordingly thinking there's no way this is gonna happen early, but yes, five weeks or sorry, five days, not five weeks, five days early. Um, is when my first came and I didn't know I was in labor. They're like, everyone told me practitioners, nurses, I called like, you'll know if it's labor. And I did not early labor was very confusing to me. And I was like reading online and I've actually, I've written it all up and I can, I can put the link somewhere. I have it. It's on Reddit, like on birth stories or something, because I wanted other people to know that you might not know you're in labor and it's confusing. Um, so that I think, uh, and also just get pelvic floor therapy, just go even for a check-in, even if you don't think you need it, but most insurance covers it partially at least. And that was sort of like, that was, that was physical therapy for me, but also mental and, and emotional. Like my, my pelvic floor therapist knows me intimately in all the ways. Right. Um, so everyone should take advantage of that. Uh, And I guess my last like tidbit to offer is to like find your community in whether it's a like local community of moms, or for me, it was on social media, the group of academic mamas that have babies born in in the year that your, that your baby is expected to be, or, or, or has been born. Um, So mine was the ACA mamas 2019 or whatever on Facebook. And it's just like a beautiful community of, of people who've had babies in that year and they can answer your questions and know what you're going through. So wherever that community is, find it uh, for yourself um, to surround yourself with people who know something of what you're going through and can be there to answer your questions. Going off on that like community or people, I will say that we had the immense privilege of hiring a doula for my second pregnancy, which was really, really important because we had um, sort of like an unexpected, like towards the end, my um, <clears throat> liver started failing. And so we got to this point where you get your tests done and they're like, we need to get this baby out right now. Cause like, there's a risk that it's gonna die. And it's like, oh, okay, I guess like we're not leaving the hospital and I have a three-year-old at home. And like, who do I call? Cause we have no family around, like panic. And so I guess there's a lot of unexpected things with parenting and we're lucky to have friends that just jumped right in, picked up my son from daycare, came to see us and like everything was sort of taken care of just by other people. But I will say that having a doula was amazing because there was so much that we were not planning that we did not know. And I guess just having someone that knows how hospitals work was important for me as I was like, you know, frustrated and like thinking like, oh my gosh, how much money is this going to cost? Because like, (laughs) we cannot afford it. (laughs) 
which was not something you should be thinking when you're trying to have a baby, right? Uh, or give birth to a baby. But yeah, I'm gonna say that the doula for us was an immense privilege and really, really important. Awesome. Um, thank you all so, so much for being so open, for being so honest and for sharing your stories. Um, I think everyone has been absolutely amazing. Everyone that has been watching has absolutely loved it. Um, and uh, thank you all for being here. So thanks everyone for being here. Thanks everyone for watching, um, whether you're watching right now or later on. Um, thank you again. Um, this panel is brought to you by PhD Balance and goodbye. I think that's it. <laughs> Thanks so much for organizing, Linda. Thank you. Thank you. I, I do think that as we were open to come here, I do think we're probably all open to answer questions if you want to message or anything. Um, I'm, at least I know that I am. If you ever have any questions, happy to Thank give her perspective. Yeah. Likewise. Awesome. Thank you. I will make I'll make sure and I'll put everyone's social medias that I have into the description so that people can reach out to you if they need to. So thank you so much again and goodbye to everyone.